mission is child protection in general, and we are working at uh, on two different uh, aspects of that. We are working with direct services. We are having a small residential program with 14, 15 kids uh, that will stay here for about a year. And then what is what really is the largest portion of the program is our advocacy and training program in which we reach out to caregivers, uh, social workers, teachers, uh, police officers, uh, police trainers, um, all over the country actually. And um, also in other Southeast Asian countries. Uh, we're in five other countries right now in Southeast okay. Asia. We're in, um, uh, in Thailand, uh, Burma, Cambodia, Vietnam and Malaysia. And actually in a couple of weeks we will go into the Maldives as well. So that will be the, the sixth in, on the line. And um, well, it's um, the, we have a particular focus on prevention of child sexual abuse and exploitation. And we came to work with that actually about 10, 12 years ago after having worked directly with kids for more than a decade and realizing that there was one issue that they were harboring and which they were not very willing to, to share with anybody and that was the sexual abuse and exploitation portion. And we also realized that um, it was the most, it was the heaviest of their traumas, it was uh, what would trigger them to not really believe that they would deserve to develop and to uh, progress. So we saw this, well, we had this tendency to see them you know, develop and uh, improve, but then after a while it was like they would push this uh, self-destruction button. And we started to see there was a pattern between those who had been sexually abused and those who would act in that way. Uh, so we basically concluded that it would be important to address this issue directly. And Monica, uh, who is my wife and also the co-founder of the foundation, she started to do research on the issue and found very little actually. And therefore we started to produce the materials ourselves. So over the years we have actually produced three animations that address uh, incest, uh, pedophilia, and most recently sex trafficking and children being uh, used and abused in online pornography. You, you've said that um, many children have uh, experienced, unfortunately, child abuse. Why are those children so exposed to that problem? Uh, I think that, well, dire poverty is, of course, very conducive for recruitment of children into well, the sex industry. It's very conducive for well, just the pedophiles to operate in. Um, and maybe also the living conditions that the kids they come from even before they end up on the streets are uh, very, very cramped. And um, they come from generally from very dysfunctional families. And in many cases, uh, sexual abuse and exploitation is, is part of what they carry with them. Do you do any prevention with the families in your program? Uh, we, once we have the kids in the program here, we also start to take contact to the families. Uh, first of all, in order to figure out if there's a basis to think about reunifying the kids with their families. And in those cases where we believe that uh, there's it's, it's solid that we can do it and the kids, they can continue a positive development, they can go to school, have their education, then we'll pursue that solution. Uh, when that does not work, we will refer our kids to other uh, institutions uh, where they will continue their, their development. And uh, you talked about the uh, advocacy that you do with uh, different um, groups. Uh, how does it work and what does it, uh, what is the result, what does it change? We run a campaign that we call Break the Silence and it's breaking the silence around the violence against chil children and particularly the violence as in sexual abuse and exploitation because it is a big taboo. Right? 
it's a taboo basically all over the world, some places more than, than other places. So we, um, we started up the campaign and uh, objective number one is just to create awareness about uh, the problem, about the, the violence uh, against children in, in, in that manner. Uh, because it's, it's very obvious that um, an atmosphere of silence is very uh, supportive of any offender. The offender will tell the child, uh, we don't talk about this, this is our secret, right? And society in general supports that idea because we are afraid to address the issue. So it's, um, it's important just to create awareness and to make people less afraid of talking about the issue, uh, whether it is within families, it is within organizations. When we came to the, the, the conclusion that uh, we could see that our programs, we invested a lot in those kids that we were dealing with and you know, we saw progress and uh, good development, but then suddenly we would see them you know, just drop down. It was like, wow, you know, it's, it's, from a humanitarian aspect, it's wow, a big pity. But if you start to look at it from an economical aspect as well, then all the investments that have been put into them until that point is basically wasted. Because they really, they, they just, I mean, back to the streets probably, right? And, and drugs and back into the same environment. So from more, than one, from more than one reason, it is so important that we as a child care organization uh, will professionally address that issue. And we're just one little organization amongst thousands or millions of them around the world. So it kind of became our mission to try to help to provide very good materials and uh, good training with very well interactive methodologies that really would make organizations adapt this approach, take on uh, child sexual abuse as part of their agenda and run it with the kids that they had in the program. So I mean, I, I've, I've experienced so many times that, I mean, being out visiting uh, various groups and organizations in, in, in this country and, and elsewhere as well, and you talk to them, they'll tell you about the programs, and then if you ask them the, the horrible question, if, what about child sexual abuse? Many will say, no, 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 sir, we don't, we don't have that here, right? So it's like, it's like they will consider it a shame, like, uh, instead of an issue that, of course, this is something that we have to address as well. So we're hoping to, to change that. Well, we are changing that, I can, I can say that for sure, that uh, among so many um, uh, organizations and institutions. I think probably the most radical uh, like single example is, is with, the, with the police, uh, where, of course, they are stakeholders in dealing with kids, especially kids on the streets, and they usually have a few encounters with the law enforcement in their time on the streets. And it's very important that uh, we can try to uh, change the relationship between the law enforcement and, and the kids because as we have experienced it, it's not very, um, it's not very um, helpful for, for anybody actually. Uh, in terms of the sexual abuse, we have experienced that it is by the law enforcement not really considered to be the that grave crime that it is in, in actuality, it's, it's you know, considered as being much lighter. Maybe more emphasis is put onto the sex portion than the abuse portion of the, of the word combination here. Uh, so we actually started uh, five, six, seven years ago to train uh, in police schools, police academies. And we, we managed uh, just a couple of years ago to actually get an agreement where we are now in every single police training institute in, in the country, in 17 regions, and training thousands and thousands of cadets. Last year we trained more than 11,000 just in, in that one year. And um, the feedback that we get from the cadets is, uh, is quite amazing. Uh, maybe because the training that we provide uh, is so odd in comparison to everything else that they that they experience in that period of training. Uh, I mean, the training is focused very much on actually affecting the, the heart, right, and rather than, than the head. Uh, it's a matter of attitude, uh, that it's the attitude that we, we try to, to change rather than actually applying new, new knowledge. And, well, I, I believe that we, we are quite successful in, in doing that. 
And um, through the years, uh, you're talking about succe successful stories. Uh, you've been doing this work for quite a few years. Would you have one example of a success story that really you were proud of, particularly? Um, well, there's a few just around within, you know, shouting reads, I would say, <laughs> right? uh, from uh, kids that were in the program before who are now working with us and, um, well, kids who have also been exposed to, to all sorts of, of abuse and uh, now I would say they are, they are quite well functioning, right? They are having families, they are working here and they are definitely becoming, uh, they have become assets um, very valuable for, for the organization. We also have many on the outside um, in terms of well, kids who have graduated from a program who are out and now they are actually working and being the breadwinners for their families. So, yeah, it, um, quite, quite a few. We, we operate with very few kids in the program, so you can say that it, it is kind of a luxury program. But I think it's also very, very important to stress the fact that despite the fact that we know that there are hundreds of thousands of street kids in the Philippines probably, right, and, and millions around the world. It is, it is an issue that requires urgent attention actually, but it is not an issue that we can solve by setting up, you know, factory-like institutions that will provide shelter and education and, you know, food, uh, medication, and then this is done. Because, you know, no matter how many there are out there, they are all still individuals that will require, I mean, they're individuals that carry a pretty heavy luggage, most of them. So they all require a special attention. They all require, well, most of all, they require to have a taste of what they've been deprived of, which is childhood. Right? And what's the essential part of childhood? That's love and care and, you know, affirmation that uh, you're great, we believe in you, you can, right? Because the kids, when they come in here, uh, pretty much all of them, they come in with an attitude of, uh, I cannot. Not that they say it, but, you know, it's part of their mannerism that already they display that, right? And they display it in how they interact with each other, with us, in the uh, initial state of their, of their stay here. But um, with a lot of attention with programs that are designed in such a way that they can, you know, show creativity, develop creativity, uh, play music, do arts, drama, sing, dance, uh, have academics, uh, work with their hands and, you know, foremost, just do all of this in an atmosphere of trust and love, right? Then it creates actually small miracles. But again, you know, it's a very small group and there are so many out there, so it ain't cheap, right? It's, a, you know, it's, it's an investment. But I just don't believe that we can, we can shortcut that, right? And if we look five years back, we have like 60 kids who graduated and we actually can be very, very, we're quite sure that only two of those 60 kids returned to the streets um, at a time after they had left here. And dealing with that category of, of, uh, of children, of boys, uh, I, I, I'm very sure that that's a pretty um, remarkable statistic. Right? Absolutely. So, and uh, talking about investments, why would you say it is still important for you to receive support from international organizations such as Levre Léger, for example? Well, this is what keeps our wheels rolling, right? We, um, we have uh, support from Léger, we have support from Germany, from Denmark. Our main uh, source of income is actually from Denmark. We have from uh, Hong Kong, uh, from Holland before, and so on. We have from many different places. Um, but I mean, Leche Foundation is, has been a, a, a pretty steady partner for many, many years. And uh, we have had quite a few people from Leche Foundation coming here. I said more from any other partner, I would say, right? And we have been visiting there for, I mean, quite a few times. So it's. Um, I mean, the, the monetary aspect, of course, is 
totally and absolutely necessary, right? But aside from that, I think it's also it's also uh, quite significant that there is a relationship between the donor and the recipient down here that resembles something like a partnership, right? And that is only created based on uh, understanding, right? Uh, mutual understanding of the situations that I mean the predicaments that uh, you can be in, as you know, uh, the the. Okay, that, that the, the responsibility to keep up that support to the partners that you've engaged with, right, and uh, the challenges in doing so. And on your side, uh, understanding the challenges that we have in implementing the programs under, you know, conditions that may, might change from basically day to day, right. So, yeah. If you um, would have, you must certainly have a lot, but if you would have one wish for Stairway's future, what would it be? Only one. <laughs> um, what would one wish be? A beautiful Christmas. <laughs> no, I mean, of course, one wish would be that uh, that uh, the organization will uh, live way beyond the time that uh, that I'm going to be sitting as a director for it, right? Uh, well, Monica and I, we found it, and it, it is, you know, it's a baby, of course, right? But we are trying very, very hard to uh, develop it as a professional organization that is not uh, so solely depending on one or two people. So we, you know, we have our departments, we have the head of departments, we have our management team, right? So we, uh, I mean, responsibilities are widely delegated to people who are very competent, right? So it's, um, we can we can move away and and uh, do other stuff for for a while, and we can go fundraising or whatever we have to do, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that that activities here stop, right? I mean, of course, we we like to believe that we still contribute something to the organization, but it's not paralyzed in the event that we that we pull out, right? And we will definitely work uh, very um, uh, determined. Uh, in order to make sure that by the time that we will retire from what we're doing, there will be a very solid uh, replacement that will keep on running. So I guess uh, the longevity of the organization would be my one wish, right? Let's hope for it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.